You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne Tha God. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. The legendary. Oh, the legend. Not Robert just a special Tell. guest. Yes. <laughs> Welcome, Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're talking about uh, Black Hollywood. You are one of the architects of Black Hollywood, I would say. Well, uh, well, thank you. You know, I mean, I, I've been in the game a minute, and yeah. I think, you know, uh, kind of started it, jump-started it. You know, Hollywood Shuffle was one of the first films. She's Gotta Have It came out in New York, and Keenan and I did Hollywood Shuffle in, in L.A. Mm -hmm. was, was it easy or difficult for you to get films made as a black man in, in, in that era? Very difficult. I mean, we didn't have, you know, they only did like one black movie a year back then, and so, you know, when, uh, oh, I'm sorry, thank you so much. Uh, we only did one black movie a year, so when I did Hollywood Shuffle, you know, it was kind of groundbreaking because now you got everybody that's writing, directing, producing, and picking up a camera. Mm -hmm. Back then, everybody was kind of a little scared, you know. You and Keenan Ivy Wayans always had such a great relationship, too. How did that come about? Uh, in New York City. I was doing stand-up. Keenan was at the Improv, and back then, everybody was at the Improv. Jay Leno was the host, and Robin Williams, Billy Crystal, Robert Klein, all these people, and... We were the only two brothers online. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we kind of connected and then had all these dreams. And then Keenan was like, my whole family's funny. And that's when I met, you know, Little Sean and Marlon and everybody. Well, you ain't signed all of them. Make sure you get points off all of them. <laughs> 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 you did hook them up, though. Well, they, yeah. you, know, you know, it's so funny. Damon's first uh, <laughs> uh, uh, time on the screen was in Hollywood Shuffle. He only had two lines. So, I mean, he was working at a, a deli here called Smiley's or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was a deli on, uh, uh, on, on Ninth Avenue. Hollywood Shuffle was basically about a guy taking shucking and jiving roles that showed black people in a negative light, right? Like reinforcing the negative stereotypes of black people? Yeah, well, I mean, back then, uh, uh, the only parts that we were auditioning for were like slaves, runaway slaves, you got pimps, you got hustlers, the illiterate basketball players. So it was always those stereotypical roles. And so Keenan and I were thinking about like, well, how do we flip the script? How do we do a story about these images and kind of give our real truth? How did, why, why did Hollywood allow that? At that time, like, why did they let y'all make that movie? Because it was kind of like making fun of them, in a way. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't, Hollywood didn't allow us. Mm -hmm. You know, we just, you know, we were being renegades. I mean, uh, the whole legend behind Hollywood Shuffle was that, you know, I financed the film with my own personal money and then credit cards. Did you? Yes, I really okay. did. So, How much did it cost so, back then? Uh, it was about $100,000 to do the movie, and then we eventually did close to $8 million. Wow. wow. So, you know, so that's how the legend of, you know, Townsend started, but... I think part of it was we weren't going to be denied, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, Keenan's really funny, you know, I'm funny. And so we came up and we, we were both hungry to be writers and nobody was doing anything. I mean, like I said, you know, Spike had done She's Gotta Have It, but nobody was doing anything. Mm -hmm. And we just said, let's just take it. You know, either we're going to die doing the, the, the jive stuff they got us doing or we're going to change the game. I like this because people don't hear these stories. You know what I'm saying? They don't hear that you had to finance the movie yourself, you know, instead of beating down these white men, people's doors, begging them to do something. Well, you know, I mean, you know, when I look at the images, you know, back then, they were trying to keep us in a box. Mm -hmm. And the more you see, you know, the, the ignorant brother on TV or some stupid stuff, mm -hmm. then, you know, you keep, you dumb everybody down and everybody keeps, you know, dumbing down. And I think with Hollywood Shuffle, we kind of shook the game up a little bit. And I think a lot of filmmakers were born because they go, if, if Townsend could do it and Keenan can do it, I can make my own movies. Well, how did people watch Hollywood Shuffle but still end up chucking and jiving and dumbing themselves down, especially black people? Uh, you, you know, people want to work. So, you know, mm -hmm. part of the thing in Hollywood Shuffle was that, you know, you know, I, I, you know we wrote the line, there's always work at the post office. Because mm -hmm. some people feel like, you know, if they, if they could be on TV, you know, they don't care whatever part they're going to play, they just want to do the part instead mm -hmm. of, like, really thinking about it and going, like, you know, I, you know like my mentor is Sidney Portier. That was the first cat I ever met when I got to Hollywood. I just wanted to meet him. And he had dignity back in the 50s. And he just, you know, he, he, he broke it down for me. He says, man, it's the power to say no. You don't have to say yes to everything. It's the power to say no. And, and that's my mantra to this day. What do you think about some of these comedians and actors that play those type of roles and they play them roles over and over and over again? You know, you know the funny thing is that, you know, people got to work. Every man's got to live with his own conscience and every woman's got to live with it, her own conscience. And so if you cool with it, that's, that's, that's for you. But, you know, the thing for me is that everything I've ever created, I'm really proud of. Mm -hmm. So every movie, every television show, I mean, the, the fact that 
people watch it to this day, you know, different things. And so I, I think that's a testament to the work, you know. But, you and know, I, so, and I don't think there's no go oh, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say I, I was gonna also ask, you know, back then it seems like jokes you could be freer as a comedian as far as doing jokes and doing things like that. Now it seems like this time Whatever you say is really scrutinized. Like you see Kevin Hart with the whole Oscars controversy. Yes, yes. And him stepping down from hosting the Oscars. Oh, y'all, y'all must forget when Robert Townsend directed him. Mm-hmm. Huh? Eddie Murphy Raw. Yeah, yeah. Eddie Murphy Raw. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, wanted, you, talk about, you talk about, you know, somebody that going up to the wall, going across. The, the first <laughs> cut of the movie was Triple X, was rated Triple X. Because Eddie was that raw. He yeah, was that yeah, live, yeah. and we shot at the Paramount Theater. So You know how raw you got to be to just have your words be triple X? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, no, but, you know, back then, Eddie still is, is a beast, you know what I mean? But back then, he just went all the way. So where Kevin Hart, and what they're talking about with Kevin Hart is, like, really mild when I see the whole controversy. Because mm-hmm. Eddie did, you know, if you look at raw, he did, he was going buck wild. And they so, wanted him to host two years ago, Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Which makes no sense to me. <laughs> I don't know. Now, why, why was it acceptable then, but not acceptable now? Uh, you know what? I think, you know, now everybody's more politi- politically correct, you mm-hmm. know, in terms of like, you know, if you talk about this person, that's bad. If you talk about this person, that's bad. Back then, we were just free. And I think as artists, like Richard Pryor, he is the comedy god. And Richard would talk about any and everything, so he never censored himself. I think now we're into a period of censorship because if you speak out against the wrong person, you could get, you know, backlash on social media. People won't, you know, they'll pick at your show. So it's a crazy time. Mm -hmm. Now let's discuss what we're here for because this is one of my favorite movies of all time. Thank you. The Five Heartbeats. You have the documentary about the making of it. And I saw that you put on Twitter that Denzel and Whitney Houston were originally casted. You know what? Uh, I had I wanted to cast Whitney Houston mm-hmm. in the part of Baby Doll, mm-hmm. and so I came to New York City to meet with her, her and her father, and we were this close to having her in the film. And then her agent said the part was too small, and so you see in a documentary where I talk about how Whitney called me and she says I made a mistake, I should have been in the Five Heartbeats. Mm-hmm. Baby Doll did a great job though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Troy Troy was amazing in mm-hmm. the film. And but you know she was going to be in it. Been crazy. Been Denzel crazy. was going to be my first choice to be Eddie King Jr. But then when Michael came in and I met with Michael, I was like, "This is the dude to play this Eddie is King." It. I didn't realize the Five Heartbeats wasn't a real group until this year. What? You know what? I'm I saw. No, I saw you tweeted that, <laughs> and everybody went crazy. <laughs> they were like, you know, I thought y'all was real. Like sometimes I go to the airport and people stop me and go like, "When you guys gonna be touring again, man? <laughs> <laughs> when y'all dropping an album, Rob? When y'all dropping an album, Duck? You know?" And I go like, "No, no, I'm a filmmaker, you know." But people think we are a real group. But those songs are like real songs that are, you know, pl- could play like for real on the radio. <laughs> well, you know, like this I wish. Oh, you know the new. Okay. <laughs> No, Keenan and I are working on a Broadway show right now. No. We're working on a Broadway show. We got a a top Broadway producer. I can't mention his name right now. And he's going to work with us. And we also have a Grammy winning blah, 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 blah with all these album of the years that's going to write new music. Go ahead, John Legend. You know, I didn't say John Legend. I didn't say who it is. See, that's good timing because you see Motown the musical was there, and then mm-hmm. the Temptations have their musical as well. Um, who else? Cher has a musical out right now. That's going to be awesome. To thank you, thank you. Heartbeat. So we're in the trenches now. You know, we've been. You know, we wrote a. You know, there's a song uh, that when Eddie leaves the group, when he you know gets all skinny and he goes gang, there is a song that will you know will break your heart. You know, all those groups are real. See, this is what messed me up about the Five Heartbeats. I'm watching it because you know it repeats all the time. Yes. So something decided to make me pull out my laptop and say, "Let me Google and see what Eddie Kane them doing now." Eddie Kane. And I'm serious. <laughs> and it was like Five Heartbeats fictional group. And I'm like, this can't be yeah, real. I'm they had a real soundtrack. I didn't know it was like the Five until Heartbeats. You just said it. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> you guys, get out of here! Get out of here! And then I was reading about no. it. How it Isn't was it based, based on the all these other different groups. I saw you tweeted about that, and then I saw all of these different people comment like, "They're not real. They're not real. What do you mean they're not real? Oh my God, the Five Heartbeats." I was dead serious. I wasn't even. People were like, "Oh, you trolling?" I'm like, I had no idea the Five Heartbeats was real. What you mean? I always knew it wasn't real. Wow. No, when when I went to me and Michael went to David Ruffin's funeral. It's in the documentary. You'll see I went to the funeral 
And when we went to the funeral, they had sections for the different groups, like the Four Tops over here, the Temps over there, the Miracles over here. And the usher said, you know, like, we saved seats for the heartbeats because we knew y'all was coming. <laughs> and it was like, and I was like, dude, we're That's not real. Hilarious. And they had us sitting next to it, you know, so it was like, but like, like a real group. So what was the inspiration for that film? Just... <laughs> It, it, okay, so here's the here's the uh, here's the truth. When I was a kid, uh, growing up in West Side of Chicago, you know, 1968, I'm a little kid, and I hear Herb Kent, the Cool Gen, on WVON mm -hmm. in Chicago. He says the Temptations are breaking up. David Ruffin is leaving the group. Mm. And when I heard that, I was like, "That's the greatest group of all time. Mm -hmm. Why y'all breaking up? Hit after hit." And in my brain, it was like, "I want to know what happened." They sing all these beautiful love songs. Do they really have love in their lives? And then that became the catalyst to when I became an adult after Hollywood Shuffle, I said to Keenan, I want to do a story about what happened to a group like that. And so uh, that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. So why wow. are you doing a doc about it? The journey behind the movie, you will not believe. The, the, the documentary is like a movie unto itself. I saw close to 10,000 actors to find the four actors to be in the movie. Wow. Wow. I had open calls in New York open calls in L.A., open calls in Chicago. In Chicago, you see online this young cat in a group, you know, uh, auditioning, and I, there was something about him, and I go like, this dude got something. Wait a minute, this dude really has something. And then I talked to him, and I had like thousands of people online. The guy online was R. Kelly. Get out of the here. Audition so, for the five heartbeats? Auditioning R. for the Kelly five heartbeats. Wow, wow. And we have the video, so when you see the documentary, you oh see God. all the people you see a young Don Cheadle. You see Niecy Nash. Wow. Uh, it's all these people. You got all this footage? You, wait until you see the documentary. I can't well, God wait to saved see you this. because they'd have been pulling five heartbeats off all them repeats <laughs> of R. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, didn't, why didn't R. Kelly make it? Uh, you, you know what? Something? Because at that point, I had, uh, I had uh, Choir Boy, I had JT, and I just didn't know what part he was going to play. But he was really, you know, you know, but I just saw something in him and he was sharing like, you know, stuff that he was writing. And I was like, you know, give me. So, you know, in the documentary, you see all these people, you know, wow. because back then I, I, I did it so that because sometimes uh, the best talent, they don't have agents, they don't have managers. And so I said, let me go in the hood and let me just see if I can find this talent and I found like Harry Lennox all these different people that came out of it the little girl the scene in there we haven't finished yet uh, she was I, there was 5,000 people online she was probably like number 600 or something and she just sang for me and it inspired me and I went back to the hotel and wrote the scene did she ever wow. do anything like in a music career after that because her voice was amazing she's touring the world now she sings all around the world mm -hmm. I mean she's she, that was really her singing she was you know and she was only 11 years old back then so you gotta be in her 40s now right yeah she's, she's a grown woman yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I was going to ask you why was it important to share this experience, but now I, I get it. Well, you know, I mean, here's the thing. People have been asking me for years about, hey, Rob, why don't you do a sequel to The Five Heartbeats? Why don't you do da 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 And I could never figure out a sequel, but I said, you know what would be really cool if people, you know, really got a sense of what happened and how I made the movie. So mm -hmm. it's kind of one part is a master class with me because you see me with my storyboards, you see the auditions, you see the casting. Uh, let me say this, nobody wanted the movie. All the studios passed on the script. Wow. Really? Wow. So you see today, me and Keenan, we, we're, we're, we're writing the script, we hand it into the studio, we think we're gonna get a green light, and they say, no. So how did it work back then? You just had to do the script first, and then production companies and studios would attach themselves to it? Or? Well, I had to deal with Warner Brothers, and so they were gonna make the movie, and they were like, oh, it's good, it's good. But then they said, well, how are you gonna make it funny and dramatic, and how you know the music is gonna work? And they got sec they got cold feet, and then everybody passed. So how did they eventually end up getting greenlit? Uh, after three years, I got new managers, and this is all in the documentary. Mm -hmm. And then I got the green light. And then at that point, you know, I don't want to give everything away, but Keenan had left because Keenan was going to play JT. Keenan had left to do in Living Color, and so then that twisted everything. It had to be very difficult to explain black culture to white executives then, because it's it's difficult now. So I can imagine back then. Well, you know, they, let me say this. That was the first time you had seen five black men bonding, you know, like a family. You know, like they go through their fights, and at the end of the day, they have a picnic together, and they come back together in their family. Mm -hmm. To explain that to Hollywood, you know, was a trip because they were like, well, aren't, aren't they all in jail? You know, shouldn't they oh all be God. thieves? Oh shouldn't God. they all be? And it was just all the stereotypical stuff. And then I was like, no, no, we all, we come in different you know, we're not monolithic. Yeah, we yeah. all are different types, and and you know, so 
when the five Harveys came out, you know, the movie bombed at the box office. It did. I didn't it know. bombed. I mean, you, you'll you know, that's why I said you. Yeah, when you, you got to see the documentary. Yeah, yeah. You got to see the documentary. Some of the most powerful scenes in there are when they're on that tour bus and they get pulled over by the cops and the co- or in the on the um in the car and the cops make them sing to prove that they're a music group and also you the cover of the album real. when it was they had white people on the cover of the album instead of what they really looked like just to show the time period that came from the dales you know it, when 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 uh you, you know in, in the doc you you discover that the dales are my technical advisors and there's a reason why and you got to see it but then the dales their first album cover was oh what a night you know like their big hit and on the cover is a white couple on michigan avenue looking so much in love and so when i asked him i said well why don't you guys get to be on your own cover? And then like they're in their 70s and they their heads went down like this. And then they said, the record company said, if they saw our faces, white people wouldn't buy the album. Mm-mm. And so they said, well, you, your face can't be on. He says, this will help you cross over. And then that's when it gets into the whole conversation about the crossover as a double cross. What about Baby Doll now? The, her situation in the movie, was that based on a real situation also? Uh, With her... Um, she was the one that was Duck's wife, right? No, oh, no, no. no. Wait, You're what talking was Duck's about wife name? Tanya. Tanya, Tanya. Sawyer, okay, yes. his girlfriend. Yeah, and she messed around with JT. Mm-hmm. Is that yeah. based on something real? That was based on a lot of stuff the Dales told me because what happened is a lot of guys would fall in love with the same woman on the road, and then you know one guy would go like, oh, you know, the, the girl in Kansas City, and then the next thing you know, she would be like, <laughs> you know, on the on the tour bus. So all of that is real. All that stuff came from the Dales. Were there any groups that got mad at y'all? Like, y'all telling too many secrets? No, you know what? It was just all, I mean, everybody from the OJs to uh, the the Four Tops, the Spinners, everybody was, it's all love. Everybody was like, that's our story. Mm-hmm. You know, because they were young kids. They were like 17 years old, and so they never made no money. They, they bought them a Cadillac, and that's all they saw. And a lot of them were just excited to get girls. And then later on, they was like, we ain't making no money. So all of that, you know, like Dresser in the Five Heartbeats when, you know, he has a kid and he's thinking about, you know, getting an abortion and then we give him the money. All that stuff was real, you know, because they couldn't afford to, to be on the road. Was everybody no. singing for real? That was No, no, I cast the voices. The, the, the guys can sing, but I wanted Choir Boy to have a real high falsetto voice. I wanted Dresser to have bass. I wanted Eddie to be that rough, you know, like, you know, I, you know like David Ruff and that kind of sound. Mm-hmm. Is the Five Heartbeats your crown jewel? For your films? Uh, you know what? I've done a lot of different movies, so I don't say that that's the crown jewel because Meteor, Me- Meteor Man represents another part oh, of me. Oh, we will talk about that. You know, <laughs> uh, Baps is another part of me as a director. Holiday, Holiday Heart, Heart is another part. So all the different things I've created, you know, my body of work, you know, I think, I, you know, I think a real artist shows their versatility. They just show you that they can touch any kind of genre. Oh, you mentioned Meteor Man. Before Black Panther and Luke Cage, there was Meteor Man. What gave you the idea idea to do a black superhero back then? And how did that do too? How, how did that do in the box office? It didn't do well either. <laughs> it didn't do. Let me I, let me say because back did do well for you. Bro. <laughs> nothing. No. No. You know. Let, let, let me let me say let me say this. Time's been say. kind to you. <laughs> Time's been good to you. Here, here's the thing. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, those films are considered classics yes. by yes. a lot of people. So when I did Meteor Man, my nephew at the time, Greg Jr., it was Halloween and. You know, he, I was like, are you going to be, you know, what you going to be for Halloween? Uh, Spider-Man, Superman, mm-hmm. Batman. He goes, I can't be them because they're white. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, he's a little wow. kid, you know, but he saw color. And I was like, I got to create a, a, a superhero for, you know, you know, mm-hmm. people of color and for everybody. Mm-hmm. And I'll create my own rather than like, hey, I got to get a book or I got to get Marvel to give me one of the characters. I'll just create mine, you know, and create villains like the Golden Lords. And I'll create this whole world and I'll get an all-star cast because we had everybody from, you know, Luther, Luther Vandross to James Earl Jones, Marla Gibbs, Robert Guillaume, Naughty by Nature, Cypress Hill, another bad creation. So I put everybody in it and I was going after a billion dollars. And, you know, like when I look up and I see, you know, Black Panther make a billion dollars, I wasn't wrong. It's just that the times it, it, I was ahead of the curve. So that was your mindset. Like you said, I know media man can make a billion dollars. Yeah, that was my mindset. Because at that point, there was no black superheroes. Right, and you so, said what your nephew had to say. So imagine how many right. other little kids felt that but way. But see, the problem was black people were taking their kids to see what the what they wanted to see. Because we didn't have any black movies for kids. Back then, the only black movie for kids was The Wiz. Mm. And then there was The Wiz. And mm. then there was The Wiz. Right. Mm. And that was it. So I was like, if I could get this, but kid, you know, Black people were taking their kids to see Minister Society or Boys in the Boys Hood, the and they just say, come with us. 
So so they didn't see the value of a superhero. You think Media Man was too jokey? Well, you know, you know, let me say this. Uh, um, there was a part of, you know, the thing that it's very serious, but it's also jokey. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are people that go like, Media Man is my movie. And I'm just, you know, I'm a comedian. So I'm going to give you the funny rather than like, be a dark superhero, Meteor Man, he comes. You know, I didn't want to do that. But that's what like, it seemed like. It seemed like a spoof of a superhero movie. Well, it, it, it was, but it wasn't. You know, like, I think Blank Man was more of a spoof. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think... <laughs> <laughs> I about Blank Man, right? <laughs> but I say Meteor Man because at the end of the day, he really did have to fight. He was slapstick in a way, but at the end of the day, you know, the Golden Lords really tried to come after him, and, you know, it was what it was. Uh, Holiday Heart. Yes. Was it your idea to dress up Ving Rams as a woman? <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was it to just emasculate that big black man? You know, here's the thing. <laughs> Cheryl West, who wrote who wrote Holiday Heart, you know, is a brilliant writer. And when I read the script, I just thought it was a brilliant piece about a non-traditional family. And then different actors came in mind. And I think, you know, I think it's one of Ving Rams' best roles. I think he really nailed Holiday Heart. And I think uh, Alfre Woodard, as Wanda, you know, she laid it out. So for me, again, this is that that Robert the Pure Artist, I will, you know, tackle any subject matter, and I think I did it justice. No, I respect Ving Rhames, because, I mean, he did Holiday Heart, then he went on to do Pulp Fiction. You, so many guys would not do those roles at all, especially black men. He, he, you know, let, let me say this. He's a real, you know, here's the thing. He's a real actor. It's, it's kind of like when I think of uh, Jeffrey Wright. Jeffrey Wright is one of the best actors in America, and Who's he will refresh me on who Jeffrey Wright is. Jeffrey Wright, well, he played the drug lord in uh, Shaft. Got you. He's okay. on, okay. Uh, you know, and he, he's on Westworld right now. But he also did Angels in America. He did Basquiat. I mean, brilliant actor. But I think the best actors are chameleons. Mm. And so I think with Ving, he took on a challenge, and I, I applaud the brother. That's what acting is, though. Yeah, that's what it really, really yeah. what it is. Now, we see some of these shows, uh, movies, getting remade like She's Gotta Have It is a series on Netflix. Do you think that anything that you've done, you could see coming back as a series somewhere? People have been asking me about reboots. So, you know, because, you know, like m my library of stuff, it's all prime. So on one hand, BAPS mm -hmm. as a, a sequel to BAPS, Meteor Man uh, as a TV series, Five Heartbeats potentially as a TV series. Bold, the Black, the Beautiful, you know, so there's different things that I've touched, you know, so, but there's all this new stuff in my head, so I don't know if I'll ever, re if I'll repeat those, I may, I may not, but right now there's, there's a, 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 a two one-hour dramas that I've pitched that I think are really, really good, but I'm on, I'm on the next frequency now. So. You think it's a great time right now for, for you as an artist for doing what you do just because there are so many outlets? I think I think it is a great time. The, the thing for me is that everything I've ever done is really different, and so it's just trying to find the right, you know, you know, the right network or you know, distribution partner that wants to do something different. Because I'm I'm coming with something really the stuff that I got in my brain right now is just on some twisted new next level like stuff. Like what? I can't really. You know, <laughs> tell you now. I ain't gonna That's tell you now. But it's like it's it's but but is it's it all. Is it comedy? Is it horror? Is it drama? Is it? It's a mixture. Mm -hmm. It's a mixture of stuff because. Like some of the best movies and television shows, they say things, you know, they shock people, they shake it up. And so the shows that I have, it's like nothing on television right now. What do you watch now that's on television? Like if Robert Townsend has a weekend to just chill and finally catch up on some good TV or movies, what are you watching? Oh man, uh, what have, you know, uh, shoot. The last thing I really loved was Get Out. That was like one of my, you know, I thought he, he, he came with it. Uh, I'm still watching Dave Chappelle's show. You know, I'm old school, so it's like his stuff is really beautiful and funny to me. Uh, haven't seen any new movies that I'm like crazy, crazy about. But right now, in terms of television, there's shows that I got to catch up on, but I've just been writing, you know, working on the show, so I've been, you know, writing. Is Could you sad? understand why Dave Chappelle walked away from the Chappelle show? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a genius. I, I really, there, there's a few, you know, like Richard Pryor is a comedy guy. Eddie Murphy's up there, and I think Dave Chappelle, you know, because... And Rock, I throw Rock up there, too. Yes, 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 I throw yeah. Rock in there, too. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the thing for me is that I, I think that his brain, you know, because every laugh ain't, the, ain't a good laugh, right. and he heard those other laughs where, you know, because he's out there on the, in the zone, you know, he heard that other laugh where it's like, wait a minute, they kind of laughing from some racism here, yeah, not from laughing the, at me, not with me, not with me. And so I think I applaud him for, you know, for being that guy.
You know, with BAPS, right? I'm just going back real quick. You, uh, I feel like BAPS would be kind of contradictory to Hollywood Shuffle. I haven't seen BAPS in a while, but it seemed like it was black African princesses, but they were all, they were both negative stereotypes of black women. Well, you know, not, not, you know, here's the thing. I was looking at them as like the Beverly Hillbillies. Okay. Like fish like out of water. Fish out of yeah, water. And then they go into the thing and they don't know anything. But at the end of the day, they're smart and they're savvy. And at the end of it, it breaks your heart. And, and they really, they don't take the money. They're not gold diggers. And at the end of the day, he knows that as well. And they inherit like hundreds of millions of dollars. So mm-hmm. it was like a fairy tale. Got you. Don't you love seeing people getting dressed up for Halloween still as the characters? As, you know that? what? There's so many women that that wear the the two the <laughs> the orange outfit with the crown and then the booyah on their thing, and it's just beautiful. <laughs> you know, it's beautiful. No, no, no. You know, it, again, um, I look at that as like you know I've created you know a classic that people would want to do that and love the movie like that. I was gonna say you know you, you talked about Dave Chappelle and we talked about Living Color. You think we'll ever see? comedy like that again on TV like that sketch comedy like that I think there yeah I, yeah, I think there'll, there'll be a new group that will emerge that will have that kind of sensibility because that's real funny stuff and to me very politically and, they'll, correct. and they'll be snatched off after the first episode <laughs> <laughs> after the first episode they'll be taken off the air you know, no, no, no. I, I, no I, here's here's the thing. I, I think with all the new platforms, you know, there's going to be a new group of comedians mm-hmm. that come up with their stuff, and they will emerge and they'll rise to the top. I, it, it's always going to happen. I just think after a certain point, like when I go into comedy clubs now, everybody's doing the same kind of act, so they all have the same kind of voice, you know. Like, and, and so I just think that, you know, after a time, that that new that new those new artists will will emerge. I think for a newer comedians it's probably harder to because it's such a politically correct time. Like some of the ones that are already established, I feel like you can get away with more because you're already established, you've made it. But for people trying to make it, they might be a little more cautious just because of the time. But you but you know, I really think it's the delivery of the joke, it's Mm -hmm. the comedy. I think it's really like like I keep going back to Chappelle because he knows how to do it in a way that is really funny. I think some guys are a little bit Mm heavy-handed, and so that's why they get a lot of flack, because it's, like, really heavy-handed. Like, Richard did it because he was like a kid. Eddie did it the same way. He would say a lot of stuff, but he said it in a kid-like voice. I think some guys are more heavy-handed. And Eddie made, I mean, Richard made a lot of fun of himself Yes. No, I mean, Richard, you know, I mean, Richard Pryor, he signed me to my first deal when I came to L.A., you know, he had a company at, uh, Jim Brown was running it at Columbia Studios. He had a $40 million deal, and back then, $40 million was like $200 million. And uh, I was a young comedian, and he signed me to my first deal to make movies. Hold on, let's talk about that then, because, you know, there's all these talks about black gatekeepers in Hollywood and black gatekeepers let certain people in. Who let you in? Was it Richard? Richard Pryor, well, my first, Richard Pryor was the first one to put me down. But the 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 first uh, break I got was a movie called A Soldier's Story, and that was Norman Jewison directing it, and it was me, it was Denzel, it was David Allen Greer, it was Howard Rollins, it was a guy named Adolph Caesar. That was my first like break where I, I got to be in a movie that was nominated for Academy Awards, and uh, uh, and I got to be a regular person, and it was a quality movie. Wow, that was the first one. So you would credit that guy as your gatekeeper, Norman, whatever. I wouldn't say gatekeep. You know, here, here's the thing. I, I think, you know, it's kind of like... You made things happen for yourself, too, though, because you were like, we're going to write this, we're going to fund it ourselves. Well, before because... all of that, though, I'm talking about just your entry into this. Well, well I, I think, you know, you know, like, let me let me say this. Sidney Poitier said this. A lot of times people see, like, uh, in the heat of the night, and he slaps the white dude, and, you know, it's like all this dignity and all this stuff. And he said something to me, and he said, there are men that don't look like us that care about making a difference. And, you know, you may say gatekeepers, but then there's good people in the world, too, that say, hey, this, this ain't right. Like in the civil rights movement, there was white people standing with black people, too. There were stars like Marlon Brando standing next to James Baldwin and next to Martin Luther King. So in Hollywood, there have been allies that said, mm-hmm. you know, like Alan Ladd Jr. with Meteor Man. He says, you know, like, you know, Robert, I, I know you want to do a black superhero. I believe in you, and let's do this movie. So, you know, you need those champions. Yeah, I call yeah, them champions. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, you told Vanity Fair, and you mentioned it earlier, that your agent once told you that they only do one black movie a year. Right. And just do it and be happy. Right. How did you not get discouraged? You know, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, the thing for me is that I'm hard-headed. You know, I, I well, like when we did Hollywood Shuffle, 
I was like, it doesn't look that hard to make a movie. It, it, some people, it looked really hard for me. I, I come from the streets, so I'm, I'm a hustler, so I'm gonna figure out how to hustle. So I figured out, like even editing, like so we get a camera, we get leftover film, mm -hmm. you know, and we shoot with the, the 35 millimeter, the big cameras back then. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, you know, I said to Keenan, I said, how can we edit cheaply? You know, the editing studio costs like 5,000 a week. Mm -hmm. But then I said, wait a minute, we could edit at a porno house, porno production house that's really cheap because they make cheap porno, and that's where we edited that's the funny first that you part said of that. <laughs> Exhibit was just Exhibit in. He was said just in here. He got his first video shot by a porn, a, a, a porn director. Not his director. first video, but yeah, one of his most not, classic videos. One that videos. nobody would do. Yeah, he had yeah. And so I'm in there. I'm in the editing room, you know, in an editing suite with 15 porno editors and me. And How does so, it smell? It, <laughs> it was just an editor. But <laughs> well, you're like, let me run that one back and see. Exactly. I, no, you, you, no, you could hear the director. You know, the, the only funny thing about being in there is that you could hear the porn. You could hear the porno directors edit. You know, directing the soundtrack. You hear like, put your leg down, put your head back, put your leg down, put your head back. You know. And so I was in there for like, you know, like four weeks. But that's wow. you know, hustling, just hustling. Is Rob, that, Robert got to go. I know, man. Yeah, Damn, man. Go. I got so many questions, but you know. Well, let's make sure we watch this documentary. By so right. it's it's playing at the the Maisel up in Harlem. It's going to be playing there uh, until Thursday. The Maisel. It's the, the Maisel. Maisel Documentary Center. It's at 129th and Lenox Avenue. 129th and Lenox. And then uh, it's just for this week because we're 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 um, you know trying to be eligible for the Academy you know Academy Awards as well as the Image Awards. And so we just want people to get out for one week, and then it'll be available in February on uh, DVD and stream. Services. What, no network wants the Five Heartbeats documentary as much as they rerun it over. I and over? know people feel like it's old school. People, a lot of people but feel they like they rerun it over I, and over. It was VH1, on thanks. Like, it was on Bounce last night. I, I don't know. So that should be it, common sense for any network. Is like that's easy. But see, but they feel like with a documentary, you know, black people don't watch documentaries. Oh yes, we, so I that's love that's what I so, watch all So so that's time. part that's part of the thing. So that's why you know uh, you know again I got to be an independent here. Mm -hmm. So if people follow me on Instagram and Twitter, I'm verified, you know, if you want to get <laughs> the get the documentary, you know, it'll be available in February. My right. last question real quick. What is your view on Black Hollywood today? Are we in a, a new renaissance or is this just a, flat, a, a fad? Is it fleeting? What is it? I think it's a beautiful time in Hollywood right now. It was like the other day I went to a, a Black Panther event uh, for Ruth Carter, who, who did the wardrobe for uh, Baps and Meteor Man and Five Heartbeats, and to see her, and she's probably gonna be up for another Academy Award. I think uh, a lot of people are doing a lot of really good work, so mm -hmm. I think it's a good time in Hollywood. And the thing, you know, uh, the thing for me is that, you know, it's about quality. Quality is always gonna rise to the top. Like I said, Jordan Peele, I'm digging what he's doing. Like I love the show that, you know, uh, with Tracy Morgan. You know, the the last, last OG, OG. Yeah. you know, I mean, so I think a lot of quality work is being done. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. All right. Well, hey, man, thank you guys so much for having me you, on man. the show. I appreciate, right, you. appreciate it. I would love to. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It's Robert Townsend. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. 